Good afternoon and good morning to you, depending on where you are. My name is Jose Leon. I am the Chief Medical Officer for the National Center for Health and Public Housing. Thank you for attending this live webinar addressing tobacco dependency to reduce COVID-19 risks and complications. Uh, this is a, a two webinar series. We are going to have this first webinar today and in a few weeks, uh, we are going to have our second webinar. Uh, all the information uh, is on our website uh, regarding dates and times for the webinars and the training uh, activities uh, hosted by the National Center for Health and Public Housing. Also, you can, con you can um, um, subscribe to our, to our uh, weekly digest where you will find all this information. It's such a great pleasure to have you all um attending this webinar next slide uh, before we get started some housekeeping items at this moment all participants are muted uh, if you would like to have an interactive session please feel free to turn your camera on uh, or you can engage in the chat and you can type your questions or your comments or any best practices or anything that you would like to discuss with uh, our panelists today. Um, uh, at the same time, you can also use the raise hand icon that is at the top of uh, Zoom. And then your line, your line will be unmuted. And the, the slides and recording links uh, for the two webinars will be emailed to all participants and posted on the NCHPH website, www.nchph.org. Next slide. The National Center for Health and Public Housing is, uh, it receives funding from HRSA to provide training and technical assistance to community health centers. Uh, we provide um, training to all health centers, but we focus on those located in or immediately accessible to public housing. Next slide. Just as a quick reminder, uh, this is 2019 data, uh, 2020 data, the latest uh, provided by Harrison Health Centers uh, in 2020, uh, over one uh, over thir uh, 1,300 health centers provided. Um, data and they serve around 29, 28.5 million patients in 2020. 400, uh, 435 uh, health centers are located in or immediately accessible to public housing and in 2020 they provided um, services to 5.1 million patients. And 107 uh, of the health center of the 435 health centers are public housing primary care grantees who provided uh, uh, services to uh, almost uh, eight, uh, 80, uh, 80, 86, uh, 866,000 patients in the United States. Uh, next slide. Just a quick reminder in case you are not familiar with the public housing demographics, uh, there are around 1.7 million patients living in public housing. And uh, there are a couple of things that are really interesting and uh, worth mentioning. 38% um, of the households report to have at least one person with a disability. And 35% of the households report to have a pay, uh, or someone living in the uh, unit who is, at, uh, is 65 or older. 95% of those living in public housing are low income and are under the uh, uh, poverty line. And 55% uh, of them have less than a high school diploma. So these uh, uh, social determinants of health are really important to understand in, in order to provide uh, services to public housing residents and those living in or immediately accessible to public housing. Specifically, uh, when you address some of the HRSA priorities, such as diabetes, uh, maternal health, HIV AIDS, and the other HRSA priorities that you are working on. Next slide. The, this is a really interesting slide. Uh, is um, taken from a 
publication, a hot, uh, publication, hot CDC publication, where they analyzed uh, data uh, from the two main uh, CDC surveys. And um, we can see that around 33% or one third, over one third of those living in public housing are current smokers. And uh, you see that when compared to other uh, low income populations, COPD and other uh, diseases related to smoking are, uh, um, are, or those living in public housing are more likely to have COPD and those uh, conditions are linked to, to, uh, to smoking. So this is really important. And as you can see, um, there are other, uh, other uh, chronic conditions uh, such as diabetes and asthma and, and other uh, conditions such as uh, hypertension where uh, there are more uh, likely, or oh, public housing residents are more likely to, uh, to have when compared to low income populations who are not living or who are not in public housing. Next slide. The National Center for Health and Public Housing is uh, keeping track of uh, COVID-19 data provided by health centers. And uh, all this information can be, uh, you, or you can see all this information again on our website, www.nchph.org. But uh, since we are going to discuss um, um, uh, tobacco use and COVID-19, uh, it's really important to see that in public housing primary care, specifically the 107 uh, public housing primary care grantees have reported a total of 70, over 70,000 patients uh, tested, and 64% of these are from a racial or ethnic uh, minority. Uh, at the same time, uh, they have um, so, uh, almost 7,000 total positive cases, and um, the uh, percentage is similar to the one that we just uh, discussed. And most, most of them are, are patients who are part of the uh, racial and ethnic minorities uh, um, living in the United States. Uh, next slide. It is also really important to see uh, the number of uh, immunizations, COVID-19 vaccines provided by health centers, as well as some of the challenges in obtaining COVID-19 vaccines. Um, so uh, the numbers that you're seeing are the latest numbers as of September 10th, 2021. Uh, this is the most recent information that we have collected. As you know, uh, this information is provided by health centers bi-weekly. Uh, again, if you are interested in these numbers, uh, please uh, visit our website. Next slide. So, uh, this is uh, another interesting slide regarding uh, the use of monoclonal antibodies uh, uh, for, on the therapy provided by health centers. Um, uh, these uh, numbers just uh, suggest the need to keep um, uh, track of all these uh, patients and making sure that they receive uh, early uh, treatment, specifically if they are patients who are at high risk. Uh, so we're talking about those uh, patients over the age of 65, again, those with chronic medical conditions, and those patients, uh, as you saw on the previous slides, who are part of the racial and ethnic minorities living in the United States. Next slide. So it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists for today's uh, webinar. Uh, Frank Vitali is the National Director of the Pharmacy Partnership for Tobacco Cessation has worked in the smoking cessation field since 1987, designing cessation programs and educating over 20,000 health professionals in how to help patients stop uh, tobacco use and counseling nearly 10,000 patients to quit. Frank received a BA in liberal arts from St. Vincent College in 1974 and a master's degree in psychology from Duquesne uh, University in 1988. He entered the field as a health educator, then as a clinic coordinator for the lung health study researching the differential effects of smoking cessation 
and an inhaled medication on the prevention of COPD in, in identified high-risk individuals. Fran followed this by becoming project director of Lung Health Study 2. Subsequently, he created a six-hour C program, the International Smoking Cessation Specialist Program, designed to teach pharmacists to do a smoking cessation counseling, writing the patient support booklets that accompany this training, as well as all auxiliary materials. This program has been presented throughout the US, Puerto Rico, Spain, and the United Kingdom. In addition, he contributed to content material for the uh, Prescription for Change curriculum from 2007 to 2012. Frank continued to provide cessation counseling training to pharmacists through various projects with the C2, C2, CS Today program. Recently, he designed a cessation training program and intervention protocol for psychologists in Beijing, China, as well as for the Haiti grocery chain in high Midwestern states. Frank is currently a clinical assistant professor at Purdue's College of Pharmacy, working on a myriad of projects designed to train pharmacists, physicians, respiratory therapists, and other clinicians interested in adding cessation counseling to their practice. Frank, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Dr. Leon. Thank you very much. And uh, welcome from sunny Pittsburgh, um, where the weather is actually pretty nice. <laughs> Um, so as Dr. Leon said, we are going to go over um, some facts and figures and give you some background information on the intersection between COVID and smoking, and then provide you with some uh, tips on how to help patients that you are dealing with who are interested in quitting to be able to quit successfully. Now, I want to start out by giving or kind of a little caution here. You know, every, everything else I've ever done over the years has been backed by tons and tons and tons of research. There is a, a publication called the Clinical Practice Guidelines for Treating Tobacco Use and Dependence, which is a meta-analysis of over 8,000 research studies um, that really looks at best practices in helping people um, quit smoking. So there's lots and lots and lots of data to support um, all of that and everything I usually talk about. However, with COVID, because it is so new and because it is so evolving and changing all the time, I, I, you know, I want you to take what I'm saying cautiously because there isn't a lot of data to back a lot of this up. I spent a lot of time scouring um, uh, the available uh, sites I maybe found about 20 studies and many of them were very small um, and had lots of issues with them. So what I'm presenting to you is what I think is the best information out there um, and it'll hopefully be useful to you. Now, when I talk about quitting, that I can talk about with much more confidence um, because as I said, that is backed up by lots and lots of data. Um, if you have questions, uh, please type them into the chat box. Um, Fide is helping us today and she will look at that and um, break in and ask um, the question uh, because I can't see the chat box uh, in the current um, form I am on Zoom here. So with that, please feel free to ask questions. I have no problem with you doing that and um, hopefully I'll be able to answer them. So let's look at what the information is uh, available about COVID and smoking. Um, so hopefully today we're going to look at the risk factors smoking poses for getting COVID and then look at any additional issues. And there are several arising from smoking uh, um, during the pandemic and then give you some basic strategies for helping individuals who want to quit because of COVID. So here are five questions that kept popping up as I was looking at the available research. Am I more likely to get COVID if I smoke? Will it be worse? Am I more likely to transmit the virus to somebody else? Will I be better off switching to vaping? And does being vaccinated make any difference about getting it, um, about the severity of it if I smoke or giving it to anybody else. So in general, does vaccination have anything to do with smoking? <laughs> so hopefully we can answer those five questions. 
The first one, this evidence seems pretty clear. Am I more likely to get COVID? Now, here is the answer is yes. And here's why. Smoking increases something called the ACE2 receptor in the lungs. <coughs> okay. Um, that just happens because of the chemicals in, in the smoke. It causes these ACE receptors to be created. And we also know that COVID binds with these receptors. So therefore, because you have more of them, you are much more likely to be um, infected if you are exposed to um, the COVID virus. And we know that smoking increases respiratory illnesses. And we know that COVID is a respiratory issue. So if you're more likely to get a respiratory illness in and of itself, that may increase your likelihood of con uh, contracting COVID. And then we know very clearly all those chemicals that are in cigarettes reduces immune response in general. So if your immune system is not up to par to fight any kind of um, virus, any kind of illness, you're much more likely to get sick. So a combination of these three factors, the reduced immune response, the higher risk for respiratory illnesses, but especially this increase in ACE receptors makes a smoker much more likely to get COVID. Now, when we look at smoking and immune response, we know very clearly that people who smoke get sick more often than people who don't. You know, there's a lot, a lot of data to um, show that. And then people who smoke take longer to recover from any illness whatsoever. Um, interestingly enough, oh, this was a study done about 20 years ago. They looked at people having back surgery and so shoulder surgery, and they compared those people who smoked with those people who didn't smoke. And they discovered that the people who smoked ended up in the hospital two weeks longer than those who did not smoke. So just the very fact that they smoked made their recovery time much longer. And then we know that this impaired immune response is connected to a, an increased risk of pulmonary infection. So again, we're dealing with a behavior, smoking, that increases pulmonary infections and decreases immune response. And those are exact in the end that COVID, again, attacks the respiratory system, among a lot of other things. So you are putting yourself at greater risk there. Now, we also know from the data that's out there that these are risk factors for getting COVID. Now, interestingly enough, in the, what they know so far is that smoking is not the risk factor. Um, I thought it would be, honestly, when this first started, but it looks like cardiovascular and, high, um, and hypertension seem to be the, the, the highest risk factor for getting COVID, but we all know that all of these that are on here are indeed risk factors for contracting the illness. You also will note that all of these are connected with smoking. So smoking um, increases your chances of having all these conditions and illnesses. So again, if you smoke, you're probably much more likely to get COVID than if you didn't. Here are a few studies that I were, was able to find. Um, we, we've seen this borne out. So this was done in 2020, a year ago, um, the first study. We've seen this borne out that people with underlying medical conditions got COVID more uh, uh, readily and more severely. Um, and then again, this study from 2020 that people who vaped. So this kind of answers this question a little early. We'll talk about it in more detail but people who vaped were five times more likely to test positive than people who never vaped. So yes, you're more likely to get it. Is it the most, uh, uh, the highest risk factor? No, but it certainly is a risk factor. Um, so it doesn't help if you smoke. Will it make COVID worse? So again, most of these studies, as you can see, were from last year. I couldn't find anything more current. I think they're probably still working on that. They're still gathering data. 
So it is a risk factor for worsening of COVID with smokers um, getting uh, higher odds of progression of the disease than people who never smoked. So we do know that. And they're more likely to go to the ICU and to need a ventilator. And those of you who work in hospitals know, you know, most of the time, you know, when you're on a ventilator, you probably, you, you don't, you very rarely get off of it. So if you, some people do, but you don't want to get on a ventilator. And we know that there is more, more uh, mortality um, with smokers than people who don't. So this answer is yes. If you look at the lungs, we know that smoking makes the lungs weaker in a sense because the cilia, so the cilia are all those little like brushes in your lungs that push out all the junk in the air that gets in there. Those are pretty much paralyzed when, when you smoke, so they don't work, so they can't get all that stuff out. Um, and, and as I say, clean the lungs as well as they should. This leaves the lungs more um, unable to fight infection. And so therefore you have an increase in um, getting sick and staying sick. Now, am I more likely to transmit COVID if I smoke? The answer here is probably no. You know, there is no data, there's no research on this, but if you think about it, if you smoke, you are blowing air out <laughs> more and probably more forcefully than if you didn't smoke. So we know that COVID is transmitted through the air. So, and through, you know, through, um, uh, uh, you know, droplets in the air. So if you're smoking, you are pushing the air further away from you. So again, you know, if you look at it from a practical perspective, uh, that might contribute to it. If you smoke, you're more likely to cough. Coughing again projects air. So that might increase your chances of spreading COVID. And you can't smoke if you have a mask on. So if you put those three, three things together from a practical common sense perspective, yes, you're probably more likely to transmit COVID if you smoke, but there is no clinical research to actually um, support that. Dr. Leone just showed that, um, I'm a Dr. Leo, Leo, Leone, <laughs> I know a Dr. Leone, um, just told us that most Many of the people that um, are in the in public housing are from um, these uh, um, groups, a, uh, and we know that COVID has had a higher impact on African Americans, Hispanics, Native Americans, and Alaskan Natives. So we know that many of your people that you work with are getting hit more so than the general population, and we also know that smoking. Hot, the highest rates of smoking are with Native Americans and Alaskan Natives. So with that particular population, there is this um, uh, intersection of all of those risk factors. Now, the question, whoops, question is, and many people ask this, you know, with smoking in general, should I start vaping? Is that better? Well, as I alluded to before, and this is a pretty big study uh, that was just published a few months ago. Uh, they looked at 4,300 people who vaped and they found that they were much more likely to test positive. They were five to seven times more likely to test positive. And that is because we know now very clearly that vaping does damage the lungs, um, especially because there is a chemical in it. If you look at the smoke, that is created from vaping um, that has to be made by a chemical and that is propylene glycol. And propylene glycol is antifreeze. It's the same thing they use in the theater to create um, fog on a stage. So uh, it's not good for your lungs, period. You know, no doubt about it. So there is no evidence to show that vaping is safer in terms of likeliness of getting COVID. So no, we do not recommend you switching uh, from combustible cigarettes to vaping to reduce your chances of getting COVID. 
Now, I saw this in a couple studies, so I thought it'd be worth putting into this uh, presentation. Is secondhand smoke a risk factor for getting COVID? Is there any connection at all? Well, again, there's not any scientific basis for this, and there's no clinical evidence, but from a practical perspective, we know that exposure to secondhand smoke weakens the lungs. We know it increases your risk of respiratory disease. So it's only really natural to think that yes, if you're exposed to secondhand smoke on a regular basis, you might have weaker lungs and therefore you might have a higher chance of getting COVID. So again, I would recommend that you know, people just you know, in general stay away from secondhand smoke, but um, there isn't any real strong evidence to connect that. Now with children, we know that secondhand smoke um, exposure does um, increase asthma, other respiratory illnesses and leads to weaker lungs. So again, if you have the choice and if you have the ability to stay away from the secondhand smoke, I would just in general, but again, there is no clear cut evidence that it does um, have anything to do with contracting COVID or indeed it being worse. Now, unfortunately, very, very early in the pandemic, there was a rumor that um, nicotine was protective. Apparently in some very, very early studies when they looked at who was getting um, COVID and who was being hospitalized by COVID, they discovered quite surprisingly that there were a very low number of smokers. So somebody in some newspaper or some you know, publication somewhere said, well, I wonder if that means that smoking is protecting them. So that rumor started going around, uh, as we know happens so uh, you know, often anymore. And uh, we started to see that in many, many publications. However, there is no clinical evidence at this time that that is correct. If you look at the study that was being quoted, it was only observational. And it was interesting because I think a good 75, 80% of the hospitals that they surveyed didn't even ask the patients whether or not they smoked because you know, they were overwhelmed by admissions. They were you know, concerned obviously with everything else and trying to cure these people. So they never even asked them the question. Um, there were problems with the um, methodology and Interestingly enough, some of these, when you dug deeper, some of these studies were funded by the tobacco industry. So they jumped on that rumor very, very quickly. So no, there is no evidence that smoking or, and or nicotine is protective of COVID. Now, finally, what if I'm vaccinated? Well, this has nothing to do with anything we're talking about today. Uh, obviously, vaccinated for COVID does not protect you from any smoking related illness. The medications for cessation do not interact with the vaccines. So we know, and very clearly, all individuals should be encouraged to quit, regardless of getting COVID or um, being susceptible to getting it. So I know that's not a lot of information, but that's all that's available. As I said, I probably looked at about 20 studies um, right now. So again, it is a risk factor. It does increase your, increase your chances of getting COVID and it indeed increases your chances of COVID being worse. Um, so we want to ask you to approach your patients and the people that you're working with with the pandemic as an opportunity to quit. If you've been thinking about it, and this is how I would approach people. If you've been thinking about quitting, this is the perfect time to do it. Why put yourself at an even higher risk than you already are by continuing to smoke? So I did a series of webinars last year uh, for the National Center on the details about how to help somebody quit smoking. We don't have the time to get into all of that right now. So number one, I would recommend that if you did not attend those to look into that and listen to them, they've all been recorded. 
Number two, I'm just going to go over 10 basic steps that apply to anybody who's interested in quitting smoking right now. So that's going to be the remainder of this webinar. The next one that we're doing in this series at the beginning of November, I am going to go through a, a very nice, very well done uh, resource out there about how to connect COVID um, to cessation, how to do that on a clinic wide basis. It'll give you a lot of information, posters, videos, all kinds of stuff that you can use with your patients. But today, let's focus on individuals and what you can do there. So just as a reminder, the model that I've always used and that my colleagues use is that there are two parts to smoking, so there are two parts to quitting. Smoking is both a physical addiction to nicotine, and there are seven FDA-approved medications to take care of that, but it's also a behavior. It's a habit. And we need to engage in some type of behavior change program in order for the person to quit successfully. Now, you don't have to do the behavior change. You just need to be aware of that and make sure the patient um, gets, gets involved in one. If your clinic doesn't have it, if you can't do it, every state in the country has a toll-free quit line. The number is 1-800-QUIT-NOW. It's the same number in every state. And no matter where you're at, when you dial that number, it takes you to your particular state's quit line. If you can't do anything else, refer your patients to the quit line. Um, that will get some excellent help there. But the key here is that both of these things need to be addressed simultaneously in order for someone to quit successfully. We know that this provides the best chance for an individual to be able to quit long term. So... In addition to that, or on top of all that, what are some of the things that are important to do here? First of all, it, you have to quit on a specific day. Now, I know lots of people try tapering and, and you know that's good in and of itself, but I have, in my experience, seen that tapering is only a good way to get ready to quit. It's not a good way to quit. No matter what you decide to do beforehand, you've got to stop on a specific day and just say it's done. It's over with and move on. I always liken it to breaking up with somebody. You can't say to somebody, well, I hate you. I never want to see you again. Get out of my life. But let's date five days this week, four days this week, three days the following week, and then we'll break up. You know, you know that doesn't work. So this is the same way. You, you know, again, maybe you want to cut down here and there and get as a way to get ready, but you need to pick a day and just be done. Now, no day is perfect. Some days are better than others. You don't want to do it during a very stressful time or when there's a big change in your life. So, you know, you are getting a new job. You're graduating and getting a new job. You certainly don't want to quit on the day you graduate or move. So some days are better than others, but there is no perfect day. Then you want to look at getting rid of all of your cigarettes. Now, this is not negotiable. This has to be done. You got a clean house. I mean, think about this again in, in, in breaking up with somebody. Say you're living with somebody, you decide you never want to see them again and you want to get a divorce. Could you still live with them? And nothing happened if they were in the same house? Probably not. So you've got to get kick them out, get rid of them, same thing with the cigarettes. So you want to get rid of all your cigarettes, clean out the, all the ashtrays, put them away. And I always tell people, look in your, in your car, under the sofa, in your closet, uh, just kick them out of your life. Then you want to look at two things, motivations and barriers. So what is prompting you to want to quit? And then what is keeping you from actually doing it? Now, these are typical things here um, that... Uh, People have told me over the years about why they want to quit. You know, they, they obviously want to improve their health. In many cases, cigarettes now cost so much that you're spending close to $3,000 a year on them. So that's a, that can be a big motivator for people. Um, you know, there's a new baby in the house or a grandchild comes around. Uh, less and less people are smoking. Or it can be a myriad of things. I'll tell you a quick story here. I had a, a, a woman who was well into her 70s, 
Um, and ran into my office one day frantic about wanting to quit. You know, Frank, I have to quit. I have to quit right now. I said, okay, you know, we'll, we'll uh, take care of this. You know, but calm down, take a deep. No, no, you don't understand. I have to quit right now. I said, okay, you know, I'm more than happy to help you. But I'm, I'm curious, why today? You know, you've been smoking for close to 50 years. You know, what in the world happened today that you have to quit <laughs> immediately? And before she answered that, I said, oh, I know what happened. You were across the street. You were at the doctor's office and you got some bad news about your health. And she said, no, 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 no. This has absolutely nothing to do with me. I'm going to live to be 100. It's poor little Fifi. Now, who is Fifi? Well, Fifi was her dog. And Fifi had COPD because mommy had been smoking around her all these years. Now, that is very real. Little dogs, cats, birds, you know, many um, pets can get COPD and lung cancer from exposure to secondhand smoke. So while that may sound kind of funny to you, and you know, I have to admit internally, I kind of you know, smiled and, and laughed a bit. Externally, I said, you know what, Mary, that is a fantastic reason to quit. I will do everything I can to make a healthy home for Phoebe. And then when she came in for her first follow-up visit, the first thing I asked her was, how's Fifi? So even though this woman had COPD herself, that wasn't what was motivating her. It was the dog. So my point in telling you that is unless it's hurting the person, there is no such thing as a bad motivation. And what you want to do is go with, with it, whatever you're presented. If they don't have a clear-cut motivation, then part of your job is to help them find it. And it has to be internal. Very few people quit because somebody else made them. Think about that. We only change behavior for the most part long-term if we have an internal reason, not because somebody's wagging their finger at us. Now, even though you may have a good reason to quit, you may have a good motivation, you may have an equally strong barrier that is preventing you from quitting. And for most people, this is clearly stress. So you really do need to incorporate a stress management program or whatever uh, barrier they're presenting to you, a way to overcome it in order for them to be able to be successful. Many people want to quit, but they don't think they can quit. So this is a very simple question you can ask to help them boost their confidence. What accomplishment in your life are you most proud of? And no matter what they say, you know, if they say, well, I climbed a mountain or I paid for, uh, I paid my way through school or I raised three kids on my own, you, it, what you should say immediately is if you can do that, you can quit smoking. Now, this is no magic bullet, but it does really work to get people thinking that they can quit because many people kind of frame that is as an impossible task and it's not not doable so this is a very good way to help them look at hey you were able to do that so you can do this when people quit they really just in many cases think they can just stop and make themselves not smoke that really doesn't work you need to be prepared and know what situations are likely to be problematic and then have a plan to deal with them. So this anticipate, plan, rehearse is the mantra, is the protocol for that. Know beforehand which situations are gonna be most problematic for you and then have a plan to deal with them. And that plan is called coping. So it is learning to deal with those thoughts, desires, and urges to smoke without doing it. And there are two types of coping, cognitive, changing how you think, and behavioral, changing what you do. And you can do that prior to a situation to eliminate an urge or right in the moment to deal with urges that come through. This is what a behavior program does. So it's very important that, again, the person gets involved in that, either you, through you, the clinic, a group, um, the Cancer Society, and the Lung Association, uh, or the Quit Line. There's a million resources out there. What I would suggest each one of you do is find out what is available in your area 
and put a resource sheet together so that your um, patients have access to that. In addition to that, we would suggest that everybody use a cessation medication. Now, I just have one slide for each one of these, so I'm just going to go through these very quickly. Again, we have a whole um, hour webinar on these. Um, it, should you choose to get more information, um, you know, it, it has been recorded. You can go back and listen to that. So these are the only FDA-approved medications for cessation. There are seven of them, as you see. Three of them are over the counter the nicotine patch, gum and lozenge, and then there are four prescription medications. An inhaler um, that looks like a fake cigarette, a nasal spray that looks like every other allergy medication out there, bupropion, which is Wellbutrin, and varenicline. The first five give you nicotine in a different form that is not addicting so that you can slowly taper yourself off of it. And then the last two are non-nicotine medications that act like nicotine in the brain, reduce cravings and withdrawal, and then help you um, get off of the nicotine completely. I'm just gonna go through these very, very quickly here. And again, if you want more information, you can look at that uh, webinar. Um, the patch is a big Band-Aid. It comes in three steps. Um, and you are to uh, step down when you use this. It gives you nicotine for 24 hours a day. Um, it's very easy to use. You just slap it on, uh, wear it for 24 hours, take it off and put another one on. Uh, it's been around a long time, very easy to use. The gum and the lozenge are oral, um, uh, uh, oral products. Um, the gum looks like a chiclet. You're not supposed to chew it, and I'll talk about that in a second. The lozenge looks like a big Tic Tac. I mean, you just suck on that. These give you nicotine through the buccal membrane in your mouth, um, and you have to dose yourself during the day because each piece only lasts about half an hour. So whereas the patch, you don't have to do anything. It just gives you a nice steady amount of nicotine all day long. This, you have to actively participate in. So that's kind of the difference here between these two products, whether somebody wants to actively be involved in their therapy or not. The gum, as I said, just very quickly, you do not chew it. If you chew it like regular chewing gum, all the nicotine goes into your stomach. Your stomach is acid, nicotine is base. So it's pretty much neutralized, it's useless. So you need to put this between your cheek and your gum after you um, activate it and leave it alone. This takes a lot of work, it's a lot of involvement and a lot of self-control. So only recommend this for people who are willing to follow the directions and use it correctly. This inhaler, as you can see, looks like a fake cigarette. It has nicotine in a um, uh, sponge in that little tube there on the left. And you put that into the mouthpiece and you puff on this much like you would a pipe. So it's not really inhaled into your lungs. Uh, because it would be irritating there. So this isn't very popular. Um, it hasn't been used very much and it's prescription and it costs a lot. Whereas all those three that I just talked to you about, the patch, the gum and lozenge are very expensive right now. This nasal spray, as you can see from the package, looks like um, Flonase, you know, which um, I use it mo almost every day for my allergies, operates the same way. But the problem with this is that it's, it's extremely irritating. Um, spraying nicotine up your nose is like spraying pepper spray up your nose. It, you know, it's very, very problematic. So this is not sold well. It hasn't been used very often. Bupropion is exactly the same thing as well. Butrin, this was discovered years ago to help people quit because it has the same mechanism in the brain that nicotine does, but without being addicting. However, it was marketed under the name Zyban for many, many years. And uh, over the years, its usage dropped to the point where GlaxoSmithKline decided about three or four years ago um, to stop manufacturing it. So it's only available in the generic version right now. Um, and again, it's the same thing as Wellbutrin, which is an antidepressant. The last medication to be approved is varenicline. This is a partial nicotine receptor agonist. So it fools the brain into thinking nicotine is there. 
um, helps with withdrawal, but it also blocks the nicotine molecule from getting to the brain. So this has been the most widely used and um, um, you know, the last product to be approved. As far as I know, there really isn't anything out there that is knocking on the door right now. So we're, these are the seven medications that we are um, left to, to use. Now, most of my colleagues are doing this most of the time. They're combining the products together, which has been shown very clearly to be safe and effective. We use the patch to get rid of the baseline um, withdrawal and then one of the other medications to deal with situational urges, you know, the, the short-term things that pop up because of um, a trigger situation. So you use the short-acting formulation to get over the hump um, while you're using the patch to get rid of the basic withdrawal. Most people end up only using the second, form, second product for a few weeks until they're comfortable and then they just continue to use the patch um, as prescribed or as indicated. Bupropion on the patch, that was part of one of, of the study to get bupropion approved. So you can use those two together. Using varenicline and bupropion, there is no research to show that that is safe and effective. And as I said just a moment ago, varenicline pretty much prevents nicotine from hitting the brain. Now it doesn't do that completely. So using varenicline with NRT might help in an individual person um, but there might not be any real indication to do that. These are the re recommended treatment regimes, so you can look at that on your own. It's important for people to also, in this process, get support. So you can be part of that, but I also recommend getting a um, person in their home situation at work, anybody who is there that's going to help. And what I mean by that is that it's a person they, the individual can go to when they need them, not somebody who's going to be policing them and you know, watching for everything they do. And this is a good reason to, to join a group program or to use the quit line. And then finally, the, 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 you know, the 10th tip here is to say goodbye. In many, many cases, um, especially with women, there is a real relationship there between the cigarette and the person. So it does help, and I know this may sound kind of weird to some people, but I found that this works to actually say goodbye, to do something to say, you know what, you were a big part of my life. I depended on you for a lot of things, but now I know you're hurting me, you're killing me, you're costing me a lot of money, so I'm done. Get out of my life. <laughs> so. There are many ways to do this. And, and again, I think this is very powerful and um, can be quite helpful. We don't have a lot of time today to go into all of this, but it can be an integral part of, of the quitting process. Finally here, this what doesn't work um, are all these things and including vaping. And again, people ask me that, should I switch to vaping uh, instead of cigarettes, while we know vaping is safer than smoking combustible tobacco, it is not safe. So the answer right now is no, 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 and no. All right, and so I'd like to end with this to say that people who smoke do not plan to fail when they make a quit attempt. They just, they fail to plan. So the key word here for all of you is to help your patients create a plan individualized for their specific needs um, so that they can quit successfully. And now with the pandemic, it is as, as pressing as ever to have them quit um, and use this time as an opportunity. And that's how I would approach your patients and you know, the people that you're working with is this is a great opportunity for you to quit. This is my contact information. Um, Dr. Leon has that information too, if you need to um, contact me. And if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, call or email me. I'd be happy to um, 
help you in any way I can, if it's an individual patient or with um, doing, uh, helping you set up a uh, program at your clinic. So we have a few minutes here. If, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them now. Um, there is one more um, presentation in this series. And is that November the B day? What day is that? <laughs> Thank you. I knew you had it there. I was gonna say it was either the second or the third. Um, so we're gonna look at your experience with cessation. So we'd like to, for you to come with your stories, but more importantly, I, as I said, I have this really great resource that I wanna go over with you um, that gives you for free a lot of information that you can use to set up a um, clinic, a cessation clinic within your clinic in this pandemic uh, era. So thank you. If you have any questions, please shoot them out. Thank you, Frank. Uh... If you have any questions, uh, please, uh, uh, you can use the Q&A uh, feature. It does at the bottom of Zoom, or you can also use the uh, raise hand uh, feature, which is also at the bottom of Zoom, and you can ask uh, your question verbally. Uh, in the meantime, uh, please do not forget to complete the post survey uh, after this webinar is done. Your, your um, responses are really important to us and, and they help us to improve uh, our training and technical assistance activities. Um, so please, again, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to use any of the two features that I just mentioned. In the meantime, Frank, um, if there is any question and if somebody's typing, uh, a couple of things, Frank, regarding COVID-19 and smoking. Um, even though uh, you have, I mean, you have uh, basically stated, you know, uh, of the uh, relationship between COVID uh, and the smoking. And there is also uh, the, uh, Others uh, or the other um, links. Uh, some people are have other chronic medical conditions due to their uh, uh, due to smoking. Uh, like, uh, and we can mention all, all those uh, chronic medical conditions that are listed. Uh, you know, and the CDC has been right. uh, mentioning like uh, high, uh, all cardiovascular diseases or emphysema or. A COPD or cancer, lung cancer, has, you, know, you know, is is one of the the uh, conditions basically listed. So um, this is a really good opportunity, Frank. You know, even if if uh, you are not addressing probably the smoking part of it, you know, to remind people with other chronic medical conditions to you know, to uh, stop smoking and at the same absolutely. time provide some additional information and resources. No, you're absolutely right. And we know that the, the five or six biggest um, conditions that smoking causes are also the five or six biggest risk factors for getting COVID. <laughs> so that, you know, there's a natural connection right there. So you're absolutely right. Right. The other thing, Frank, is... Um, do you have any experience or have you heard anything about providing some of these smoking uh, um, est strategies or, or sessions uh, virtually? At, at this moment, some of the services provided by the health centers are virtual, you know, either, uh, I mean, as a phone call or, or a uh, video call or conference call. So have you heard uh, anything, can you know? Related to um, yes, it, it, it works just fine. I, I personally did a big project with NASCAR many years ago with the NASCAR teams. And I met with, I only met with them once because they're all down in Charlotte. And I did the whole program with probably a, a thousand people by phone. 
and that was before Zoom even existed. So I, you know, I never saw them and I, and it was very successful. So yes, it can be done either over Zoom. Uh, you know, I like to be able to see people. So that's what I would prefer. But yeah, it, the fact that you're having the contact with the counselor, the, um, you know, the physician, the pharmacist, whoever, um, it is the important uh, issue here. It doesn't matter so much matter how that contact occurs. So it's, it, it's getting that information and getting that support. Those are the two big things. So that can be done by phone, by Zoom, in, in person. But yes, I do know that many places are doing all of this by over Zoom now, and it does seem to be working. I don't have any clinical data to, to get point you to, but I do know anecdotally that yes, it does work. Thank you, Frank. And uh, the last uh, question from me is, you know, one of the issues that uh, people are experiencing is the fact that due to co uh, due to COVID, you know, um, there is an increase of uh, behavioral health issues, you know, and sometimes these behavioral health issues, uh, people tend to start smoking, you know, or right. increase right. You know, the number of cigarettes. So right. do you think that during COVID is, I mean, you were, you were talking about, you know, choose the right time. The no, thing right. is, the, the thing is that COVID has lasted for two years and probably is going to be with us forever, you know? So, so any recommendation or any advice on yeah, that? Yeah, so that's interesting that you bring that up because that's how I'm going to start the next session. I'm going to talk about that <laughs> and talk about the specific reasons why people have given over this last 18 months about why they started again. So yeah, so that is a very big issue and it's just an excuse. You know, so we need to really deal with the, you know, the bigger issue here um, in terms of how, so what you're, what many of these people are saying is they think smoking is going to help them deal with COVID and obviously it can't do that. It's only going to make it worse. So we've got to, we've got to look at that central belief, but that's exactly how I'm going to start off the next session is by looking at, I think six or seven reasons why people have given to us about why they started back during COVID and how to deal, how to help patients look at healthy ways of dealing with that situation rather than going back to smoking. So that's a very good segue to the next session. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Frank. Uh, Kide, do we have any questions? No, not at the moment. Not at the moment. All right. And so, uh, on behalf of the National Center for Health and Public Housing, on behalf of Frank and the uh, HERSA grantees, I'd like to thank you all for attending this webinar. Please make sure that you visit our website, again, nchph.org. You are going to find resources on uh, HERSA priorities and other um, uh, health topics that uh, affect public or people living in public housing. You can also find uh, maps and uh, funding opportunities and information on senior programs and information on upcoming webinars. So please visit our website, uh, uh, www.nchph.org. You can also contact us um, and we will be happy to uh, help you with any questions that you have. Um, at the same time, uh, you can go to our website and see other activities and upcoming activities. So please make sure that you are in touch with the National Center for Health and Public Housing. And thank you, Frank, for this presentation. And You're we, welcome. We look, we look forward to uh, learning about the COVID-19 resources that you are presenting on November 2nd. All right. See you then. All right. Thank you so much. Thank and you. everybody have a great afternoon. All righty. Bye-bye.